Thanks, welcome back. Oh, black fly right in the eye. Well, that is not a good start. That is not a good start, but welcome back nonetheless. As you can tell, uh, spring is here. Black fly season is just on the cusp of getting going. I'm out here on my old golf cart here, and if you guys listen, this golf cart is not sounding like the other one, and by other one, I mean the 1984 club car. This thing, I believe, is about a 1981 or 1982 Yamaha G2, I think. Regardless, this sounds a lot different than my other one, and that's for good reason. This is a two-stroke engine, and I happen to be out here on the trails just sort of making sure that this thing's up to par. I've been working on this thing off and on, just like some of my other equipment, for quite some time. This happens to be one of those pieces that just hasn't been running right. Anyways, what I'm doing today, aside from getting this cart going and making sure it's operational, is I'm gonna sharpen some sawmill blades. Whoa, that thing's got a bit of juice to it. So I just on my way back to the shop, gonna get out the old sawmill sharpener, or uh, saw blade sharpener, and I'll also get out the setter. We'll uh, get that into action, hopefully put a few blades back into motion so that we can be back out here cutting wood. I'm gonna make a pit stop here in just a moment, show you a few other things I've been up to, because let's face it, if I were to do nothing but cut wood, well, that means maintenance is taking a back seat, and that is not the truth. I'm out here doing maintenance days quite often, whether you guys are seeing it or not, and I'm gonna show you some of the things that I've accomplished. Some I think is, uh, well, quite the task, and some probably just an inconvenience. Let's go have a look. It's ripping. All right, first pit stop. Well, first pit stop, and it's a good pit stop because that means the cart is stopping, is uh, on, on the uh, IBC cages behind me. You guys can see here, I've been splitting quite a bit of wood lately, and I've been splitting it as fast as I can because bug season's coming. You guys saw a bug fly, uh, blood fly, blood fly? black fly hit me square in the eye uh, as we started there. It is no fun being out here splitting wood when black flies are kicking around. Just having a look here, I'm not quite sure how many IBC cages I got full, but I think there's a fair chunk here. Now, as you can see, uh, all these are loosely filled and check out my other videos if you want to know why I loosely fill them. But these are basically a mixture here. I've got some softwood, some hardwood in here, predominantly softwood in here. I just throw it in here so I can move it around with my tractor forks and that way I'm not uh, handling the wood more than I have to. I bring it out to this open location so the sun can dry it. And uh, as you can tell, that works pretty well because I've been burning it like this for a number of years now. Now, you're also going to notice that some of this wood is not this year's wood. This right here I split last year. And for those of you who burn wood, you probably know that based on the color of the wood. It starts to gray if it gets older. This stuff here, I literally split it probably a night or two ago. And as you can tell, it's, uh, it's not that gray color. So... Why was this a big deal? Well, first and foremost, it took a bit of effort, but besides that, I had to fix my wood splitter before I got that split. My wood splitter is just up here. And one thing is great about this is that it runs right now. One thing that was not great about this is that the linkages down in here, which controls the throttle, you guys have a little look-see in there. Notice how it's kind of Mickey Mouse in there. There's some, there's some wires and some zip ties and all that sort of thing. Well, that was my fix for now, because without that, it wouldn't have run. And without that running, obviously, I'm not getting the wood filled. And without the wood, uh, wood IBC cages getting filled, well, then obviously, I'm not going to have heat for my home. What am I getting at? Well, that task there, fixing the wood splitter, is just one of those maintenance things that acts as sort of a thorn in my backside. i got to pull it out eventually, or I'm going to be facing the consequences. Anyways, let's continue on our journey here. Now let's just have a little quick look at my Yamaha golf cart here before we continue on. So as I mentioned, this thing here is an original made in Japan Yamaha 1981 or 2 G2, I think it is. You guys can correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong there. This thing's a beautiful unit. I, I really like it. It's nice and comfortable. It doesn't exactly run the best from time to time, and last year was one of those times. In fact, I was plugging away on this, doing some maintenance up until recently to get it to run. Let's open up the lid on this thing. And as you guys can tell there, that's a, that's a bit of a struggle. What I was trying to do to get this thing running was first and foremost, diagnose the problem. It was backfiring really, really bad. And usually that to me means that's a, some sort of a carburetor issue 
or in my books, I thought maybe it was an ignition issue. Um, it was basically putting excess fuel into the, into the hot exhaust and then it was igniting. So what I did was I first and foremost, I started off by rebuilding the original carburetor and then ultimately I bought an, another one. That's a brand new carburetor. Put that on, did not fix the problem. Put a new ignition coil in, did not fix the problem. Put a newish battery in, that did not fix the problem. So after I got done throwing money at this thing and thinking, boy, I should just as well sell it and get rid of the problem, I started digging around a little bit in the wiring. Checked all the fuses, they were good. Checked all the wiring up here, that was good. Dug around in the back there where the engine goes and I found a wire. I found a wire that had broke. I fixed the wire and guess what? Fired right up. This thing has been a beautiful thing ever since. Hopefully you guys see this a little bit more on the channel because I really like driving it. In fact, I drive this more than my car. All right, let's continue on. Thing's a bit of a brute. All right. Oh yeah. Here's my next brief pit stop on the right. We we'll call it a brief uh, pit roll. There's some wood I've been splitting as well on the right. A lot of this stuff is gonna be firewood, uh, camp firewood. Some of it will be burned in the house. There it is there sitting out here to dry. Anyways, let's continue on to the shop and then we'll get some blades going. All right, guys, well, final destination. We made it up here to the shop. I'm gonna head on in in just a second. This right here running really well, and I'm happy to say that you'll see this in a lot more upcoming videos. I love tooting around on these things. They're a load of fun. All right, guys, just heading on inside here. I just want to tell you one more thing before I open this door. I'm about to show you inside my shop, and there is gonna be a tarp that's covering something. That's for good reason. I don't tend to tarp things inside a building. It happens to be there so you can't see what's underneath. What it's gonna be is a future project. You guys are welcome to speculate, guess what it is down below in the comments, but I'm not gonna tell you quite yet what it is because I don't think the time is right. What I can tell you is you should come back to see what that project's gonna be because I think it's a good one. So let's head on inside here. Just before I go, let's make sure I don't forget my sludge. And so here we are. And you guys are probably saying to yourself, boy, have you not, have you not cleaned that thing since the last time we've been in here? And talking about the shop no not really I don't clean the shop all that often the truth of the matter is this is sort of my workspace not exactly my clean workspace I clean it from time to time but it definitely doesn't get cleaned all that often I tend to find myself out doing those maintenance chores or maybe out even cutting some wood for fun as opposed to in here sweeping up dust regardless let's get down do it here so here's the star of the show today here is my grind Lux 4000 uh, bought this thing off Woodland Mills this gets a lot of use around here. It keeps all my blades sharp. You guys can see the setup here. I've got it hooked up to a 12 volt battery and you can tell I use it. Not so much by the wood dust on top, but by all this stuff right here, I should probably wipe that off from time to time. There's all the dust from all the sharpening. So that's what we're gonna be using today. We're gonna use that in conjunction with this over here. And this is the tooth setter sold by Woodland Mills. And I found this to be a really good unit, great value, and so I picked it up uh, and put it into my arsenal. You guys can see here we have a digital readout, and we've got these devices here which help me bend the, bend the teeth. Now, I have some settings on here that I have acquired from the manual. The settings are going to be what I use to try to get my teeth bent to, and that's pretty consistent. I tend to, I tend to use 1.2 millimeters as my set, based on what the manual says, and you're gonna be seeing me do that here today. So I got a blade set up. I'm gonna get this set first. Then I'm gonna take it over to my sharpener and we'll get it spinning around here and we'll get the teeth sharpened second. So here we go. All right, guys. Well, first things first, I got my gloves on. I also got a marker out and I got my safety glasses on. I'm gonna take the blade off here so you can see what I start with. And so you guys can see how the blade comes off and you probably know this already if you own this unit. Just gonna lift that up, pop the blade off. Now I got the marker because I look for the weld on the blade and I make a little mark. I'm gonna start setting the first tooth after that mark. Now in this case, I'm gonna take off my glasses so I can see it. And I'm gonna look to see whether that blade is in fact bending inwards, bending outwards, or it's straight up and down. And in fact, that one is straight up and down. So I'm gonna go to the next tooth. That tooth there I can tell for certain is bending inwards. And so that's gonna be the first one we check the set on. And so let's get this back into the 
to center. And you guys will notice there's a little slot there. And likewise, there's a slot over here. There's my line. This thing right here, if I'm going to set the teeth or bend them inwards, it goes on that side. If I set it on this side, what's going to happen here is when I press this lever, it's going to force the tooth that way. So we're going to be going this way with the tooth based on the way it's already bent. So let's get it into the right location there. And we're going to fit it nice and eas easily over top of the blade. There we go. And so first off, we gotta we gotta get the and I don't know what it's actually called. It's like a it's like a steel pin. I think it might be called a plunger, but it puts pressure on the tooth and it bends it, and it gives you a digital readout so you can measure how much that tooth is set by. I need to get that that plunger or that steel pin touching that that tooth exactly where it needs to be. So I'm just going to advance it by hand to start until we're in the ballpark. And I think we're pretty good right there. Next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna check to make sure that when my forward, my forwarder here, or my lever that pushes the blade forward is all the way bottomed out on that bolt, that the tooth is exactly where it needs to be. And it is, okay? And why is it? Because I've made this adjustment many times before. Having a look one more time, I can see the tooth is where it needs to be. I'm going to put pressure now and I'm going to see what the digital readout is. And if I read it there, I'm at 0 0.90, 0 0.90 millimeters. What measurement am I looking for here? Well, typically I look for a measurement somewhere close to 1, 1.22 millimeters. And in fact, I write it right on the board there. If I have a measurement that's different than that, I have a measurement that's like 0 0.75 millimeters, 1.4 millimeters. I don't really care as long as all the teeth that are bending in that direction have very similar sets, very similar numbers. If they're all at 0 0.6 millimeters, then I'll leave it. If they're all at 1.2 millimeters, then I'll leave it. Where I have problems if it, if, is if one tooth is really a high number and one tooth is a really low number when they're supposed to be close. Now that I've got that set, I'm going to go ahead and advance it. And I advance it simply by pushing the lever forward and it advances at three teeth. Boom. And if you have this in alignment perfectly, or you have it set up perfectly rather, the tooth will be in perfect alignment with that steel pin or that plunger so that you can try the next one. Now this will take a little bit of adjustment if you've never used it before, but I can tell you once it's set up like I've got it, it's pretty much a cakewalk. Let's look down there. Looks good to me, it's in perfect alignment. And so we'll put pressure here and my next value is 0 0.96. That's very close to my previous value at 0 0.90 millimeters. And so I'm gonna call that good. We'll advance it again and we'll try it again. 0 0.86 millimeters. And you guys are probably thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute, those numbers aren't close. Well, yeah, they are. We're talking millimeters. We're not talking inches or centimeters. We're talking fractions of a millimeter. So yes, those numbers are very close. Now we'll advance it again, three more teeth. Put the pressure on it, 0 0.93 millimeters. So you guys are getting the point here. That is the basic process to set the teeth that are bending inwards. Eventually, once I've done one complete revolution and I'm back to the weld, I'm gonna take this off and I'm gonna put it on the other side so I can bend the teeth outwards. The teeth in the middle, the ones straight up and down, they don't get bent, and so those will be left alone. Let's go through this at full speed, just how I do it, so you can see how it works. It's pretty easy. Can you guys hear that sound there? That's just some friction with the blade, which probably has just a skiff of rust on it from sitting out. You can take a little bit of WD-40, just put it on the edge of your blade. In my experience, it makes no difference whatsoever in terms of your set, and so I don't worry about it. All right, guys, well, there we go. We made it all the way around. And so at this point of the game, what I'm gonna do is I'm simply going to put this the other way 
on the other side and I'm going to repeat the process. Now in this case you got to get lined up with the very first tooth after the weld which actually bends that way, it bends outwards. So the first tooth if you remember was straight up and down, the second one bent inwards so the third one likely bends outwards. Next thing we'll do is we'll get this one into position and I got this thing set up pretty well you guys will probably have to do the same if you're just picking up one of these units so I got this thing set up pretty well but for the most part it's pretty user friendly there's only two switches on the thing and then there's a few uh, few manual adjustments you have to do and then it's automatic it'll take over and do its thing one thing I'm going to show you guys down here is there's that mark on that weld again that's very important because I'm going to start grinding on the first tooth after the weld so I'm going to start right here and I'm going to finish right there I'm not going to grind the tooth twice I'm only ever going to grind it once I'm starting right there because sometimes the gap where the weld sits is a little bit different than the gap between two other teeth so see that weld that gap there could be a little bit different than this gap right here if that gap's a little bit different, well, this machine's not going to know that, and it might grind too much or not enough off one of the teeth, uh, depending on where you start. I find as it goes here, I like to just watch it, especially on the first blade, just to make sure the adjustments are proper. And I don't want to take too much off, and I don't want to take too little off, because then I won't be sharpening anything. And it's also important to note that if you break a tooth, which some of these are actually broken because I've used the blade a lot, it'll actually throw off the forwarding. And so you just got to watch where that broken tooth is so that you don't uh, forget about it. And it doesn't uh, ruin the rest of your blade. All right, so that's not too bad. I think I'm going to make two rounds with this, two passes to get the entire gullet. If you've seen my other video dealing with this sharpener here, you've probably seen this before. It seems somewhat unassuming. It's a galvanized piece of metal. But what it does is actually it shuts off the switches without you having to do it yourself. Check this out. If you were to take this and basically position it onto your blade, and we'll just set it up here so it doesn't interfere for now. What's going to happen is when this blade gets advanced around to this, basically this piece of metal, it's going to touch the switches and turn off the machine. That makes it so you don't have to be present in order for the machine to shut off. Because let's face it, you don't want this thing going around and around and around. Because that'll basically ruin your blade. So kind of a neat feature. And as you can see, it doesn't take too long until it gets there. Most important thing is to set it up in the right spot so it stops on the last tooth before getting on to teeth you've already sharpened. All right, guys. Well, there we go. I'm going to let that continue going here. I have a bunch of blades I got to get set and get sharpened. But one thing is great about that overall setup. What that is, is I can be self-reliant. I don't have to worry about sending those blades out to someone to have them set and sharpened and hope they get back to me for when I want to start sawing. I can get in here in the shop, get this set up in minutes with the 12 volt battery, or I could actually just take it out to the sawmill and set it up with that 12 volt battery, sharpen that and be back in business in no time. That's what I really like about that, being self-reliant. If you guys want to see more of this sharpening and setting in action, be sure to check out the playlist where I have some other videos dealing with that. Overall, it's a great setup for me. I like getting out here, getting my hands dirty and 
put my own finishing touches on my own blades and so this allows me to do that. Guys, I appreciate you being here. I hope you're all doing well out there. Enjoy yourselves, make some dust and I'll see you next time.